Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, our first Comoc panel of the year. Uh, we're excited to have three panelists to speak to us today. Uh, we are recording now, so uh, hopefully you can see the, the notice on your screen. And, and so we'll share this recording uh, after, after the webinar. Uh, for, for people to also learn from. And really the goal of this webinar is to um, help us to be more aware of kind of the richness of the environment in which uh, digital maternal and child health interventions are being developed and to have a conversation about the role of community members in, uh, in, the, in the design and development and implementation of, uh, of these interventions. And so to start off this webinar, um, webinar series, I've invited uh, three people from three different companies that do implementation of digital maternal and child health tools. And so you'll meet them in a series of presentations. Uh, I'm, I think we're gonna start with Sri uh, Ranganathan from Demagi. Uh, Demagi ha has offices in Boston, but also is based in Cape Town. Uh, and does a, a ton of work with lots of different organizations around the world around data collection. They've also been involved with a lot of um, work around contact tracing, most more recently in the US. And uh, Shri's going to talk to us about um, some of Damagi's projects and where the community uh, plays a role in, in the work that they do. Um, after that, we'll hear from Kira Lee Kunert from Digital Medic, and, uh, and we'll hear about their projects, and I'll just do another introduction uh, with each speaker. And our, our last speaker will be Martin Weiss from, um, from Gembi Technologies, and, and he'll also talk about what, what Gembi does. So without further ado, um, I am introducing Shri. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I hope everyone can can hear me. Um, and what I'll do is let me just quickly share my screen, and then we can get started. Great, thanks, Ruth. Um, um, can. Can you guys see my screen? Looks good. Perfect. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Melissa, for that uh, uh, for that introduction. Uh, and I'm excited to to sort of uh, talk and present a little bit about our, our experience uh, working working in the communities and, and sort of about how our um, products and services sort of have uh, have have benefited from from communities, but but also talk a little bit about the challenges and and, and some limitations there. Um, so. Uh, essentially, just just to take sort of take a little bit of a step back, kind of kind of our mission uh, at the Magi has has been to sort of create sustainable impact uh, for underserved populations uh, through through in innovative technology solutions for frontline workforces. Um, and so we started uh, way back in 2002, uh, but, um, uh, but but essentially we we sort of started out as a as as a custom software developing company, and and then we sort of eventually moved to this product platform. Uh, called called Comcare, uh, where we uh, you know today we we have sort of over 150 plus members uh, across across our offices over 2,000 projects and we've worked in different uh, different countries and different settings and contexts. So so I think like over the years we've, we've definitely learned a lot about uh, the 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 sort of the the social depth development space and technology for the last mile space uh, and, uh, and and a bunch of our work has has been in maternal and child health um, as, as Melissa talked about as well um, so really I think I, I you know I, I don't want to sort of go into a lot of detail but um, but kind of like you know what is what, what is sort of like the, the base of what we're doing and, and sort of what is our core work and, and I'll talk a little bit about what our model of engagement is which will which will throw light into how we engage with uh, with different stakeholders including including communities um, so essentially we offer um, you know design and, and strategy so we obviously have our team based all across the world um, 
uh, and and uh, and effectively, you know, when when we work with partners and we work with governments and we work with uh, you know other other sort of organizations, uh, the, the, so the core of our work is is design and strategy, where uh, we, we sort of help understand, sort of come on board, understand what programs are we uh, are we are we designing for. Uh, we really want to understand sort of the needs of different stakeholders, uh, and then uh, essentially figure out what what is it that we're going to design as in in, in the form of technology tool, uh, and then. And then sort of move on to actually building uh, and, and deploying that tool. Um, and again, like this, both of these sort of stages involve working with a range of stakeholders. Um, and and eventually, once we deploy that that particular tool, then a lot of that focus is, is on capacity building and ensuring that uh, uh, that the solution sustains uh, over a period of time. Um, so what's our typical model of engagement? Um, so our, our largely our, our work is is working with existing partners, and and sometimes we work sort of directly with uh, with with governments. And so so tip, in, a, in a typical model, you know, Dimagi engages with with partner organizations, and um, you know, let's just say you know we're working with X partner in South Africa, and we're looking to uh, to develop um, you know an application for community health workers here. Um, so, so often we'll we'll go we'll go meet with the partner, uh, and and sort of immediately we we go into sort of phase one of requirements gathering. So this is this is everything that the partner already uh, knows about the program, wants about the program, um, and and often uh, you know the the goal is is to talk talk about sort of the program from the perspective of challenges uh, that that uh, that organizations face, that the communities face, that the stakeholders face, whether it's the government, whether it's other NGOs, whether it's uh, um, you know, yeah, whether it's, yeah, it could be any any entity that's that's sort of involved in that community health worker program. Um, and, and we want to understand uh, from the organization's perspective, from the partner's perspective, uh, what what are these requirements? Uh, what are we trying to, what are we trying to achieve with this design? Uh, and, and this often does not involve uh, anybody else and it's and it's purely with the partner organizations, with, with the sort of the core of the NGO uh, team that, that we work with. Uh, once we understand from from the partners what what are we looking to sort of design, uh, we sort of move into phase two of requirements gathering, uh, which which is where we step into uh, step into the field. We we do something called as a scoping visit, uh, where we often spend a, a week, uh, sometimes more, uh, really understanding requirements uh, from the perspective of of who the end users are going to be. And so in, in our cases, typically it'll it'll be the community health worker or you know field field extension workers or coordinators uh, who, who are in sort of working in the last mile who, who, who are our end users and, and we, we spend a lot of time shadowing them we spend a lot of time uh, understanding their day-to-day -day routine day-to-day -day challenges uh, and and really trying to understand what is it that what what is it that would make their lives a lot easier and and through this process uh, again we 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 solely focus again more on more on that end user uh, perspective and 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 maybe to a degree uh, we we do sort of go and visit households and community members who who are sort of the beneficiaries uh, of of this tool that that we're going to build, which is you know just, obviously it's meant to be a job aid for for these extension workers or community health workers, but but ultimately it should benefit uh, the the community in terms of service delivery. So uh, we do at times. Uh, have the opportunity to to go and visit uh, members of of communities, uh, but but in most cases that that opportunity is is limited. Um, so once we sort of go into this phase two, uh, you know we we have a we have a strong comparison uh, of what we've learned in in phase two and and what what sort of uh, is the established norms in in phase one and and there's there's obviously a, you know a long process that that involves merging the phase one and phase two, uh, and and this 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 typically will will involve in you know in software development life cycles you know you you take all this content you build it into sprints. Uh, and at some point, you, you know, you start slashing out like what what is feasible to, to design in in, in one phase, uh, and and you sort of you you leave certain sections out for 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 other phases. So, so you know, we we get into we get into the sort of design phase, uh, and 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 I've I've termed it iterative design, which which again in our focus is as and when we design uh, the, the technology solution, we, we want to sort of validate what we're designing is making sense. Uh, and, and much of that will be validating against phase one and phase two requirements, but, but we want to put it into the hands of users, put it into, uh, put it into sort of community members perspective as well and, and try and get this uh, feedback as and when we're designing it. So we're able to sort of, um, you know, obviously 
ensure that that we're keeping uh, you know we're, we're keeping the quality of, of of the solution quite high uh, and and we're able to make these these small fixes uh, along the way rather than wait all the way uh, uh, rather than wait all you know uh, towards the end uh, where it can really pile up and, and make it difficult to deliver the solution on time um, and and here in this case the, the community sort of is is more involved because you know when we put this we put the tool in the hands of the of of the end users um you know whether it's a community health worker or the extension worker they would have to go and test what it is like to to go and register members in a household or uh, to to go through a service checklist uh with the with the with with the different sort of members in, in the communities and and our tool for example has features um such as audio video um SMS alerts um, uh, and and a whole bunch of other other features that that keeps the service delivery quite engaging with community members. So when we when we talk to uh, the community health workers or the extension workers, uh, part of our questions during this iterative design phase is also uh, taking into account how how the beneficiaries reacted to this content. You know, was it easy for them to understand? Was uh, should should there have been more? Should there have been less? Uh, and sort of get that get that input, but but indirectly through the through the community health workers' perspective um, or the extension workers. So so this is where you know it's, it's pretty much live design. Um, once the design phase is done, uh, then it, it's it's you know we we come back to a room where where we have sort of the broader stakeholders. And typically, this is where uh, if there are government entities involved, you you know the government sort of typically needs to sign off on on, on the content on on what's actually going out uh, to to the field. Um, and uh, and and obviously this involves all of the documentation we've made between phase one through through the whole like iterative design phase, uh, getting the NGO partners uh, and and the broader stakeholders in a room, and then we sign off on on what is to be uh, eventually sort of launched. Um, and then once once we actually do the launch, uh, which is you know community health workers now have the final uh, health application that that they will take and sort of you know serve their communities um, um, uh, th through this through this tool uh, we continue to have this iterative design phase uh, through feedback loops but primarily through the partner organizations uh, and and at times we've had the opportunity to to sort of go back into the field uh, and 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 see how the applications being used firsthand uh, see how the community is, is accessing this firsthand but but often we rely on on partner organizations to be able to channel that kind of feedback uh, whether it's design improvements, whether it's bugs, whether it's um, uh, you know just content enhancement, and so on and so forth, this is this sort of loop happens throughout the duration of the of the project. So uh, typically, this this is our our model of engagement, um, and so. You know, as 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 with this sort of model engagement and sort of our, our work across, there's there's been lots of uh, learnings and challenges, and uh, and and I'm just sort of sharing a few, and and if there's obviously more more questions, I can I can answer to them. Um, but but like I mentioned, we we, we sort of we rely heavily on existing program knowledge, structures, norms, and um, uh, because you know when when you're coming into a project setting, when you're coming into sort of a deadline timeline driven world, uh, you know you you often you often are required to sort of up and, and launch pretty quickly. Uh, and so a lot of that trust and emphasis on, on, is on stakeholders to guide uh, what those requirements are and, and, uh, and sort, of, we're sort of largely coming in as a, as a technology partner role. So, so our sort of need is to, is to produce those uh, in those timelines. So essentially time constraints play, play a barrier for us to, to explore further involvement of beneficiaries or community members and, and other stakeholders. Um, and then separately, you know, existing hierarchies both within stakeholder groups and communities can can often be a limiting factor. Um, so, for example, you know, in, in certain cultural settings, um, you, you may you may want to get the the feedback, or you may want to sort of hear from from the mothers who who are the who are sort of the primary beneficiaries of of a tool uh, that we're developing. But often, you know, they they may not be the ones. Uh, that that will be able to uh, they'll be able to share feedback. You know, it's often somebody who speaks on behalf of them, so so you don't necessarily know uh, if uh, you know if, if if we're getting the right feedback, if we're getting sort of what uh, what the what the beneficiary actually uh, is is feeling and thinking. So so the dominating voices uh, can 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 sort of end up uh, influencing. Uh, what what gets designed or what gets prioritized. Uh, but but often you know we found sort of 
quoting our experiences in other regions where, where we've had a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, of, of freedom to, to be able to explore these conversations with, with communities can, can be fruitful in other settings. You know, we've, uh, we've, we've seen that by showing that, hey, look, you know, we, we really improved the design in, you know, in, in, this, in this place and in this project because we were able to go and speak to the community, spend the extra week, uh, prioritize this kind of design versus the you know, design that we're going for. Um, it, can, it can open doors. Uh, for for more uh, sort of uh, for more sort of inputs uh, from the from the broader community. Um, so in in India, where, where you know back back in 2013 14, um, uh, you know, again it's an MCH application that we that we deployed. Um, where uh, you know even in that context, you know, men aren't seen as as the key beneficiary, but but they are often the key decision makers in 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 those sort of rural households. Um, but uh, but the outreach messages that were designed in the application typically actually were were aimed um, for for uh, for for men because you know they would decide if if they were going to make it to uh, to to a health facility visit uh, whether whether they were going to give delivery at at the facility versus a home delivery or whether they were going to choose for family planning or not and it's and it's a very much cultural context of of how these decisions get made and and so. The, the messaging, the outreach messaging, cannot just be for for the pregnant mothers, but but it needs to involve other, uh, you know, other family members and other sort of community members as well. Um, so so we've seen that we've seen that example play out in, in some settings, and its advantage is to to quote that uh, where where we can get a bit of a leeway. Um, and um, yeah, and I think separately, you know, while we have this sort of timeline focused, you know, uh, constraint, uh, because we can't then go out and, and seek other inputs, uh, being very focused on what each stakeholder needs can 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 sort of be a way of protecting influence. So often when we talk to, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders within the government, uh, stakeholders, um, uh, sort of more more administrative stakeholders, uh, they obviously care about data and then they want to care about how they can access the data and that that's often their top priority. And so tailoring our engagement to those topics sort of helps uh, with with how we can uh, ensure that that it's it's more targeted uh, targeted responses to targeted questions rather than you know needing them to, to sort of talk to how the design of the of the end user tool should look like or um, or or how the beneficiary sort of should should respond to uh, respond to these outreach messages uh, and and so on and so forth. So so in a way like we we can sort of figure out how do we ask the right questions to the right to the right folks, um, so that uh, we can it can in some ways protect uh, what what is what is really important in terms of uh, in terms of decisions to be made from a design perspective. Um, so yeah, that's that's it that's it for me. And and um, these are some of our projects, uh, some of our large scale projects that started out as um, uh, pilots, and and if, and if they're in the process of scaling, if if not, have scaled uh, in in a lot of our uh, in a lot of our uh, countries. And and the the sort of the division that I work for within the Magi focuses a lot uh, in in Africa and, and some some in East Asia as well. Um, and uh, most recently, we we worked with with the NDOH uh, um, uh, for for scaling up. Uh, for scaling up uh, the, the community health worker program to about 10,000 users, and we're currently um, on on pause while uh, while we wait for sort of additional word from from NDOH and how where to scale up further or, or when the scale up is going to resume. Great, thanks so much, Shri. Uh, it, it's really interesting to to hear all of that those insights from your experience. Um, I think we will have a time for questions uh, after all the panelists uh, kind of finish their presentations. Uh, in the meantime, if you do have a question, there is a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or wherever it is for your interface. And so you can go there and uh, ask your questions and then I and the panelists will be able to see any of those questions and, and make time to bring them up and answer. Um, and and I think I'm going to invite Kira Lee to um, share her screen and uh, and tell us more about digital medic. Um, and Kira Lee, somebody I've met only really this this year. Uh, I've heard of digital medic before. They've done a lot of work in the space of health education and really um, you know making making content broadly available in multiple languages, which I think is really great. Uh, and looking at ways to to make it 
um, to, to scale up the, the work they're doing. And this is in partnership with uh, Stanford, um, but Kiralee's based at the South Africa office of, of Digital Medic. So please go ahead. And if you can, if you if you feel comfortable sharing your video too, uh, okay, so we sure. can see you, that would be lovely. Okay. Thank you very much, Melissa. And thank you, Sheets, for that um, initial kind of introduction to the work that you're doing. I think there's a lot of, I mean, I'm sure Melissa has put this together so that there seems to be a lot of synergy in the the work that we're doing and it's great to also just hear more about what other partners are doing in the region and within the in-house space. Um, so I'm currently the program manager for South Africa and I know you did say put the video on and start that. There we go. Okay, okay. Um, and yeah, so we have a small, we part of the stand for Center for Health Education and has kind of have been active in South Africa since about 2017, 2018. We have a small team based here. There's four of us in the Cape Town office and the rest of our team is based in California, working under normal circumstances, working from the university, but at, at, the, her, at, the, at present they're working from home, as I'm pretty sure most of us are. Um, yeah, so just to introduce the work that we do and um, just a bit of a, a general background, because I'm not too sure how much people know about, um, about digital medic in South Africa. But yeah, I'm looking forward to some questions later if, if there are any areas of clarity. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, just to briefly provide our mission is to create engaging high need digital health education that can scale quickly and cost effectively to communities worldwide. We really try and focus on um, low and middle income countries or low resource settings and focusing our, our target um, group is really community health workers but understanding that community health workers are members of communities themselves so that you know, there will be beneficiaries and their clients and patients um, will be the receiving that information. Okay so what, what we do we have quite a um, you know an integrated approach we have our education design uh, global collaboration and then obviously our impact evaluation to ensure that what we are creating is having that desired um, positive health impact um, and health outcomes. We work with, so we have an, um, we have adopted a human centered design approach to our work and identify and develop educational content in partnership with our collaborators and their users or learners. So we're really trying to ensure that our content is relevant and resonates with the person who will be viewing and learning from, from what we have created. Um, and that there's also a similar, to, similar process to what Sri um, did describe, there's this iterative um, testing and engagement on the content from script writing to the storyboarding and animatics of, and the final video. So we, we really have, chosen to have a story-based approach to sharing health information so that people are able to, to remember that. And again, as I said, like that resonate, when something resonates with you, it's easier for you to remember it rather than someone standing and telling you this is what you need to do. Um, so on one hand, that's the education design, the global collaboration we really have worked with partners. We're not a distribution or dissemination organization. So we work with various partners to be able to get that information to community health workers and um, clients and patients who need that information. We have um, had some discussions with uh, Damagi and Medic Mobile, another organization, to try and see how we can kind of collaborate with, with their tools and embed certain information in that. I think that's an ongoing conversation as we really explore kind of the power of, of working together. Um, and then, really, our impact evaluation, we we work again with, with we call um, kind of, I suppose some people will call them end users. We call people who can view our content as learners because we really feel that there's health information that's being shared and you're going to be learning something from that. And um, we do this via kind of either embedded surveys or focus groups to try and understand what learning has taken place. And um, we have also done kind of randomized control trials to to determine the impact of that content in a particular area within a particular subject. Um, 
just uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our randomized control trial we did with Polanyi and Kailiche over the last kind of 18 or oh, 18, it was an 18 month period, but it finished um, in May last year. Um, but this is just a bit of an overview as to our approach. Next, we have our visual style. So this is kind of really for us to get to understand what works best and resonates best with the learner. This was also done via an iterative process, really and, um, kind of interviewing and speaking with people based in various countries to help us to be able to scale our content quite quickly. We needed to have a visual style that can, can resonate with people in various geographies. Um, so as you can see, it went from a very kind of the top left corner of the screen from a very kind of live action um, type photographic image, kind of through the various steps to something that we've landed on, which is a bit of an icon style. And for that is then it's quite easy for us to lay over various um, languages, we get different voice actors that um, will speak in that vernacular that we can put kind of lay over those images and also have closed captions that would be useful for people um, if they are watching something on the screen. Um, we have also tried to make the delivery quite um, easy to understand so that we're cutting across literacy levels as well as uh, kind of how one is able to access the, the information. So we've really kind of adapted it for easy repurposing and um, low data areas for mobile and offline use. Okay. And these were just some findings from the study that we did on, on kind of creating a universal visual style. Um, and as you can see, kind of again, the bottom left, that icon style that came up um, at about, you know, just over 50% or over 50 of the, the learners really resonated with them. So we've decided to stick with that for our, for our current content creation. Okay, and then I mentioned that we really are trying making content for low resource areas or low middle income countries and understanding that there are challenges for access to data and have explored kind of um, presenting our material across the spectrum of, um, of various access points into that. So we have um, very recently last year worked with an organization called Biomo that have done SMS and IVR um, type messages to their community health workers. So making sure that, um, Melissa, you've come onto screen, is there something I need to be doing or not doing? You have about two minutes left if I'm keeping time. Oh, wow, okay. I thought I was going to be talking too quickly. Okay, so this is the, the spectrum. So um, we really try and, uh, reach our learners through various platforms. So from YouTube to, to Facebook, Coursera is a, a way that, we, you know, on the, on the kind of full right, right side of the screen, a full web optimized learning experience where people are able to sit down and kind of access, um, access internet by a, by a laptop or desktop. So it can do that, do so via, via Coursera. And then we have our own app, which is, I think for me, one of the best features that we have an offline function as well so that when you are in a day, if you do have data access or in a Wi-Fi area, you are able to download the content and then view it when you are out, you know, either in the field or, or, or meeting with, with clients outside of the area where there's no access to data and then be able to share those videos. Okay. Next is just a kind of a various highlights from, from where we have worked. I've mentioned the the um, randomized control trial with Polanyi. We had about 1,500 participants and that was looking at exclusive breastfeeding and utilizing um, videos to be able to encourage mothers to, to um, breastfeed. We did launch a 100% breastfed campaign to really again promote exclusive breastfeeding. And we have worked with the Department of Health both nationally in South Africa and with the Western Cape Department of Health around um, the side-by-side -side campaign, creating a lot of um, complementary media content that can be used for the Road to Health booklet, as well as um, developing visual content and aids for pediatric food-based dietary guidelines. Um, again, this is kind of just some highlights again from this year, like again, just building partnerships and making sure that we are able to engage with people who 
are embedded in the community so that the, the content that is created is, is relevant. And rather than being kind of decided upon by a group of people in an office that, um, you know, we think that these are key high needs um, information areas, whereas not having that input from, from people who are working on a daily basis with some of the issues that have been, you know, that, that they think they need additional information on. Um, we had a, a quite a quick pivot to COVID-19 content creation last year. Um, up until then, we focused um, predominantly on maternal child health information, but now really, as I said, had the COVID um, focus last year, but we'll start looking again at routine care as we've realized that there's been a drop in numbers of people accessing that routine care um, that is needed, especially in the maternal and child health um, sector. And that's the end. So <laughs> I hope I haven't rushed too much through it. I'm hoping that if there are any kind of burning questions or you know, more detail that is needed to come up in the questions and answers. And I'm sure, Melissa, you'll be asking us some questions later as well. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think this like Zoom webinar interface is a bit weird because you're like, you're talking to a screen instead of faces. <laughs> and and um, a belated clapping for Sri and for <laughs> Kira Lee for, for, the, for your presentations, even if it's just me. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I have a ton of questions for, for, for both of you, um, but I'm going to give Martin a chance to uh, tell us a little bit about Gemby before, before we dive into the questions. Um, so you have about seven minutes, Martin, but if you go up to 10 minutes, I probably will, will, will be kind. <laughs> Uh, but the more time you leave for conversation, I think uh, the more fun we'll have in the, in the presentation. Sure, I'll try. I'll try. Uh, I can see the the time the, the third 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 um, presenter gets the exponentially shortest stick. Well, that's fine. Um, I will just have to talk much quicker. <laughs> um, so I'm from Gembi Health Systems. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in South Africa. Uh, we've been around for about eight years, spun out from the South African Medical Research Council. Um, we do a lot of work in Africa. Predominantly, I think we're kind of a technology enabler for health, um, uh, health systems. Um, we have uh, joint forces with the Medical Research Council, and we're the collaborating center for digital health innovation. Uh, so we represent the Medical Research Council for all things digital health, uh, and we try to assist uh, research in aligning with the goals of the National Department of Health. I'm going to skip that. Um, uh, sorry, do you see all the pictures down the side? No, okay, I'll get them on my screen. Uh, so Mom Connect, I think most of you are aware of Mom Connect. It was a collaboration between HISP and Gembi and the Precult Foundation and CSIR. Uh, it was launched in 2014. Um, it allows healthcare workers to register pregnant mothers uh, for an SMS-based uh, suite of messages um, that get sent to pregnant mothers for the duration of their pregnancy. Um, uh, to date, I think there's over 2 million mothers that have been registered. Um, mothers are registering. Uh, the registering process is available at about 600, uh, 6,000 clinics. Um, there are various uh, message suites that have been developed and are ongoing. Uh, there's also a help desk uh, where, where um, mothers can, can log in through, through WhatsApp. Um, included in this is a facility rating service, so we can give feedback to the Department of Health on how well the, the facilities are doing. Um, and it's text-based messages that, that moms get uh, throughout their pregnancy. It's been the, one of the, the real highlights of this. It's been developed around the um, Health Standards Normative Framework, which is a set of guidelines by the Department of Health on how you develop health information exchange systems. So it's based on standards, on interoperability, on harmonize data so that data can be exchanged, which is really important. Um, we've developed a couple of apps uh, over the last couple of years. Two, three of the, of the highlights, I think, are the essential medicines list um, and clinical guidelines, um, which we've taken over and are supporting for the Department of Health. 
um, as well as these two, which is the Road to Health booklet, which I'm really glad that um, uh, Digital Medic is online because I'd love to talk to you about that scene. We're both developing um, platforms to, to promote the same content. Um, so what we did here is we, we were, uh, it was mandated by the Department of Health. We built an app that would digitize the Road to Health booklet. We've also built a community, uh, sorry, a companion app for healthcare workers, which aids them in, um, in assisting the care work, uh, the, the caregivers on how to, pr how to use the Road to Health uh, booklet. So I'll play this video while I'm talking. Um, the Road to Health booklet is a self-administration ad administering app. So you download it from the app store, you register, you create an account. Uh, if you change your SIM card, if you change your network, if you change your phone, you can auto recover your, your credentials so you don't have to phone a call center. Um, it has interactive tools. So you are able to, to record your infant's um, vaccination um, uh, history as well as the the the, the infant's uh, weight uh, uh, history as well, and then it it has all the content from the Road to Health booklet, the five elements of care: nutrition, love, protection, healthcare, uh, extra care for children with special needs, and then the additional information around milestones, um, danger signs, um, and how to identify critical signs. Okay, I'm going to just jump a little forward. So this is the vaccination tracker, which allows you to select the, the age of the baby, select what vaccination was given, uh, the time, um, and you can you can capture a number of a number of infants. So there, I've got Cuppy Vice and Jojo Vice that don't really exist, but I've just added them as demo kids. Okay, I'm going, just going to can go further. Um, this project uh, we have. We, we are just completing now. It's a bespoke app store for the Department of Health. So what this means is that the National Department of Health can, can curate what apps healthcare workers are able to access. And this is quite important because it provides a central point where healthcare workers know this is where they get their apps from. Um, they only have to register once through the platform, through the, through the app store. Um, and that avoids us having to have multiple apps trying to register um, multiple times. Um, it also makes life easier for the, for, the, for the health worker as well. They just register once. Uh, all that information is stored in, in um, databases that comply with the National Department of Health's uh, um, registries, so the provider registry and the facility registry, um, which means that if your healthcare worker is registered, it's a really simple process to get them on board. So one of the apps in there is this companion app, which is the Road to Health companion app, which helps healthcare workers in um, assisting mothers in downloading the Road to Health booklet, how to register, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it also lends itself, this, these are just some screenshots, it lends itself for, for future information that we want to promote through this platform to, to uh, healthcare workers. Uh, we have built onto this a, a a content management platform, which means uh, we are able to dynamically update any of this content. So if a word changes and we need to update it, it dynamically up up updates just that particular word. You don't have to download all the content. We also have the ability to compress and uh, insert video and audio into through this content management platform. Um, so that's that. And then the last, the last thing I want to show you is really quite an innovative project that we're doing on the border between Kenya and Uganda, tracking cross-border populations around immunization. Um, this is a project that's been ongoing uh, since October 2018. Um, we've um, uh, administered almost 20,000 of these cards, which I will show you, uh, done 140,000 immunization events. And our... Um, uh, the, 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 the patients, are, 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 maybe this is a little bit back to forward, I'm, I'm going a little bit fast. Um, it, it comes in the form of a starter pack um, and it's based on some technology, which I think I'll just show you how it works. So a healthcare worker has got a dedicated phone. They have a card. They tap the card onto the back of the phone 
and they enter their PIN into the phone that gives them access to the application. This is an offline system, so you don't need connectivity. Um, it works with connectivity and we store information on the cloud as well. So the patient brings their card, healthcare worker taps the card onto the phone, and then the healthcare worker can then uh, do whatever is necessary to, to the patient. Um, they select whatever immunization is required. Uh, if, uh, if there isn't stock, they can click, click, click on stock out. Um, and as, as soon as they've completed this, what they do, oh, which I'll show you in the next step, is they take the patient's card, they tap the patient's card on the back of the phone again, and the whole of the immunization history is written to the card again. And the patient walks off with their immunization history on their card. Um, it also saves it to the cloud. So if a patient loses the ca their, their card, they're able to, to within seconds, uh, recover their whole uh, history and, and get a new card issued. Um, through this, uh, we have uh, online capabilities of generating all kinds of reports and details and monitoring of all kinds of things that's in, involved around this. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Martin. I, I think um, it's amazing to actually see the interfaces of the um, of the applications that you've been developing and to kind of get a little bit of more detailed feel for um, some of the projects that you guys have implemented. So, uh, so quite interesting. Um, I, I was wondering, actually, I mean, I'm sure you could talk a little bit more about kind of more details about the, the kind of projects you do? Because we've got this broad overview of like countries and, and, and a mention of the word ComCare, but I think maybe people won't be familiar with what ComCare does and data collection versus, you know, uh, community health education. So maybe you could highlight maybe some of the South African or African projects that you've done. Yeah, no, certainly. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, just to take a step back, uh, so ComCare is, is our sort of flagship open source um, software, uh, which typically focuses on data collection and case management. Um, so which is essentially tracking uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the life cycle of, of a particular case. So it could be a pregnant mother, it could be agricultural farms or you know, whatever that, that entity is, like you're able to like track properties over a period of time. Uh, and, then, and then at the back end, there's, there's a whole bunch of like reports uh, and sort of you know the, the whole emphasis is on on real time data collection uh, to be able to you know make make decisions faster and, and so on. So um, I think in in the in in the context of of some of our projects, I think the the South Africa one stands out uh, as you know, it's, it's one of the most recent ones that, that we worked on. So we kind of designed uh, a system where. Um, you know, we we have uh, we have a frontline tool which is the community health worker application. So this community health worker uh, now has this this uh, this application where they can go and register households, they can register beneficiaries in the households, they do screenings uh, across like key um, uh, key health areas. Um, you know, whether it's HIV screening, TB screening, um, uh, hypertension screening, you know, there's all kinds of areas that they screen for. Um, based on the results of the screening, the the the, the beneficiaries are then um, um, are referred to the to the clinic, um, and so the clinic then has another application where they they understand they know as and when the CHW raises a referral, uh, the clinic has that alert uh, um, in terms of who's going to be coming in, what dates they're going to be coming in, um, and then so there's like sort of this, this communication between the clinic application and the CHW application, um, and then in between these two applications is is is, uh, is another application called the OTL or, or the supervisor. Of the, of the CHW, uh, who basically has a, uh, has sort of an insight into all the activities that their CHWs are are doing, uh, including the number of households they're registering, who are they visiting, what you know, what what are some risks associated with certain households, uh, and then overall they get to see the performance of the CHWs because they all work based out of some targets, uh, and so they it's sort of a more of a supportive supervision kind of application for them, um, whereas they, they get visibility on both sides in terms of what's happening at the at the the facilities and the clinics and also what's what's happening at the CHW. So it's it's kind of a three-way integrated model and 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 then we've built custom reports for the NDOH to, to be looking at um, you know the key program and and, uh, and health indicators um, and based on which they, they take specific um, uh, specific actions. Great thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I, I was wondering if anybody had questions about the systems offered by Digital Medic and Demagi and Gembi, or if you wanted more, more details. Um, let's see, I'm making sure that like Q&A actually works. So I, I see Nervo has a hand up. Nervo. So I got curious about Kira's presentation about this visual style progression. So um, can you say a little bit more about how do you use it and what sort of experiences have you gotten from engaging with the communities? Um, do you think they work it well? Um, do you think there could be many different ways to use it in other different settings? Sure, thank you. Sorry, I was struggling with, with muting. Um, we, yeah, so we tested it. It was really just a test um, that was sent out um, and as I said, it was it was people globally. So it was in South Africa with the with the groups that we were, we were doing our trials, as well as learners from kind of other countries in Africa, as well as um, Eastern Europe and South America. And there really was um, kind of it really went down to find like the finer details, such as hairstyles and colors of people and what colors may mean in certain in certain cultures and areas where, where you should be using that um, as well as symbols because we were we, what we thought in some places was quite a universal symbol for a community health worker of having a cross on their chest or on a hat with a cross um, some of the responses we were getting was that it reminded them of, of their grandmother um, or the certain hairstyle in a bun is someone that would be an older woman or not necessarily a young girl so it was it was some of the that type of feedback we were getting, but really trying to find that point where where we could use an image that would um, not necessarily distract too much from the information that we were sharing, but also kind of yeah, as I said, like resonating with that learner that they could identify themselves or someone that they knew in that story. So again, kind of creating that connection so that you can remember the information that is being shared and be, becoming a, a active participant in that. Um, we are currently working with another coalition on creating an advocacy um, and training for community health workers and also going through this process now of, of design and really understanding how, how the, the characters are important, just as important as the information that you're putting together to share with, with people, especially if you're wanting to be able to scale across, across geographies. As I mentioned, we you know, we took quite a simple um, icon style so that you're able to overlay various languages and voices. I'm hoping that it has answered a little bit of your question there. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, just a follow-up question. Um, because you're trying to design contact for these communities, um, when you, how many feedback loops do you get in order to design the contact? Is it like extended period of time? So very similar to three, I think it's also dependent on the time frame for a project and oftentimes it's quite artificial. I think you can be stuck in feedback loops um, for a while to try and get your, you know, that, that ultimate um, product. So I think we, we really try to aim for at least three or four um, loops, depending on the project, how it's been planned, but making sure that where, where one can, you are able to, to change and adapt that. Obviously, um, the type of creation that we're going through is, is design and production. It takes a little bit longer to, to create that. So we try and, and front end, I suppose, a lot of that input so that we're not kind of two, two months or a couple of weeks into a project and then finding out that there, there is something that we want that needs to be changed with the character. Um, oftentimes your, your script and information that you are going to be sharing for the, the learning outcomes uh, you may have a bit more time to be able to, to tweak that, but when it comes to the design and the actual illustration, um, it's not that easy depending on where you are in your production cycle. Yeah, so we need, really need to try and get all that, um, as much as you can, that information and feedback early on. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, I, I wanna push on that for, so for, for all of you, like I, I really love that like an iterative engaging process is, is just kind of deep in your, Kind of methodology and the way you guys do things. Uh, and I, I recognize that time and budget are always like a limiting factor uh, on that user engagement. So 
I, I have like kind of two questions for all of you on that. One is like when you do get feedback, what kind of feedback is it? Is it on the content or is it on like the flow or structure of the app or or maybe, you know, does this phone work versus maybe we should go back to SMS? Like what like what level of feedback are they feeling empowered to to effectively give or what level of feedback can you actually process into kind of changes in designs? Uh, so I'll, I'll just leave with that question and then we'll do my follow-up question in a second. Um, I, I, I could go first um, and, and I'll be excited to hear uh, the responses uh, from, from others as well. Um, I, I think typically when, when we go in for these feedback sessions, uh, it's, it's often not uh, open-ended uh, from a Demagi perspective and, and we go in knowing we want targeted feedback. Um, so whether it's, yes, like, you know, we could segregate it by device, uh, design, content, um, uh, yeah, and, and sort of workflows uh, and, and sort of be very, very targeted in terms of what we're looking for. And, and that, that so sort of going back to my slide, usually sort of in that phase one where your stakeholders are largely providing you with those early requirements, um, you know, we want to validate that by saying, wait, well, does this workflow actually make sense? Like when I shadowed you in the field, I, I think I saw you do something different from what I heard uh, in, in phase one. So could you sort of, you know, make sure that this actually works the way it's supposed to work uh, or, um, or or, you know, there's there's a sense that when we design the app that based on what we learned in phase one and phase two, by designing it this way, this should have made your life easier or this, this, this should have made sort of your workflow and your job a lot, a lot more simpler. Is that actually true? So then I would ask sort of specific like workflow questions. So 99% of the time it's, it's guided and uh, it's rarely open-ended because often open-ended ones end up being more cosmetic level changes. You know, they say I change this to like green or something like that, which is which is good, which is so good, but uh, it's, it's probably not what we're looking for. Uh, I can talk, Kira, if you, if you, do you want me to go next? Go ahead, Marnie. <laughs> um, yeah, so for, for us, I think there are really three, there are three different components to this. There's the, um, there's the uh, initial design. Oh no, Martin, I think we lost you as soon as your video turned on. Uh, Curly, do you wanna maybe talk while we wait for Martin to come back? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, so we, we all got quite different products and what we're sharing. So um, for us, I, I mean, I, I described a little bit of the actual content creation testing, but then also the learning testing a lot of um, in those development phases, we'll have our kind of um, pre and post testing to ensure that the learning outcomes that have been designed um, is actually kind of hitting the right note so that people are getting out of the the content what what we intended to there Martin is back um so I, yeah apart from kind of it, it's different enough that we don't necessarily have a actual um step-by-step -step app that's used for for system or in processes it's really an information tool an education tool that we we are creating Martin do you want to go ahead while you are able to well I've got connectivity yeah thank you um so I don't know what you heard so really we I, I think we have three different aspects to this. One is uh, the, the flow, and that's how you move around within the app. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you traverse down decision trees? How do you get back to where you, where you started, uh, which is quite important. Um, for that, we, we, uh, we work with third parties to assist us in designing that. Uh, the second one is through this content platform that we have, we see, for example, we work with UCT who are developing procedural guides and EMS who are building EMS guides. The, the content specialists do not know how to design the content because they're not graphic designers, they're typically medical, uh, medical professionals. So what we do is we set up mentorship programs together with companies such as um, one of the ones we've, we're just establishing a, a, a mentorship program now is a company called Thompson Wunderm Wunderman Thompson, who's a large digital media company. They would provide us um, 
uh, mentorships for these particular health professionals to assist them in how to design content. And I think a lot of it is like Kira, uh, uh, you, you're going down the road as well, is doing animation, for example, and doing icons instead of videos and photographs. Um, we assist then in, in compressing the data, in making sure that the, the, all the colors are, are harmonized so that there's a theme, so that people understand from one app to another app how you know, the learning experience is a lot, a lot easier. People don't get fatigued in, in doing certain functions. Um, and then the third part that we do is there's a lot of automated monitoring within the app that we do. So we capture what pages people are looking at. Um, if they need to register or fill out forms, we capture where they fall out of filling in forms. Um, and that's sometimes uh, really enlightening because they, they would not fill in a form or they get, for example, the date wrong um, and they don't know how to fill in the date properly or a telephone number where they have to put a plus two seven instead of just an O. So they drop out of that form um, and we can capture where that is, feed that back to the designers and then, and then go from there. Um, so yeah, and then the third part of the monitoring that we do is we we work with HISP who who manage the uh, the national uh, indicators. So they the national indicators that all all programs report to, and we try to align all the apps to report on those uh, national indicators. And we make it simple for the developers so that they can report on those indicators. Um, so with those those three or actually four. Um, uh, views on on how users perceive the app. I think you have a quite broad view of what works and what doesn't work. Think of like a few like questions wanting to come out of this. Um, I mean, I I would be happy for you to guys like to chatter with each other to to. So if there is like engagement and questions you want to ask each other, please do. Uh, uh, and so. I, I'm thinking about um, like I have more than an hour's worth of questions to ask you guys now, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm thinking about like the the sort of the one of the premises of Comac is is really wanting the communities to be part of the design, not just like testers, not just giving feedback, but part of that design. And I think that that's an ideal, um, and, and so you know. Clearly, barriers to that ideal are timeframes and development and everything. But if we could prioritize that in a project, um, what would be kind of your wish list for, like, I guess, investigating, implementing, like, questions you'd want to ask of them, or like, what what do you think are like the community's priorities, but also what are your organization's kind of wish lists for what you could do if you weren't limited by timelines and budgets? Any order you want, just speak up. And so I have two views, <laughs> and, and this is kind of the engineering. I, I'm an electronic engineer by birth, so you know I, I don't come from an academic background, um, and I, uh, uh, I'm not a scientist, so I kind of think we perceive things very differently as engineers. So you know that old saying about if, there were, if, if uh, Henry Ford would have asked his clients, um, you know what what uh, uh, what would they like to see enhancements on the car. Um, uh, so, uh, no, how did, how did it go? Um, there's a saying, um, uh, for horse-drawn carts, if, if Henry, Henry Ford would have asked the, the people, the community, what do they want? They would have said they want faster carts and bigger horses. And what did he do? He went away and he built a car. So I don't know if it's always, you know, I think it's good to ask the end users what they want. Um, but sometimes they don't know what the possibilities are. And it's just too wide to try and explain to everybody what those possibilities are. So sometimes I think we have to be a little bit dictatorial um, and say, this is, these are the options. And you've got five or six options and we work with those. And some of the projects we've done where we kind of give points. So we get a bunch of users together and they say, we show them this is what we've done. And we say, you've got 10 points. And you can divide those points into the features. So if you want more battery power, for example, give it points, but you've only got 10. 
Um, and that forces them to narrow down what the highest priorities are that they're looking for. And suddenly they can't have a bigger screen and you know, more video and higher data. They have to start working within, within limits. Um, and I think that puts a little bit of reality in what you can actually do. Um, so that's my controversial point of view. <laughs> Shall I name you guys, Kira? Yeah, um, so I think for, for me, it really would be to get a better understanding on how people learn and how, what's the best way for, for them to be able to kind of access and retain that information. Because um, I mean, we, we have this idea that it's through story-based um, telling and, and having icons and little videos and inf the information filtering through that way. One of the things we are interested in and we have been looking at is where people kind of um, the sources that they trust in getting that information. So, you know, coming from digital, digital medic or Stanford, is it really going to be trusted? Yes, we may be a credible organization. We've got a lot of faculty and staff who can draw on for that really good medical information, but is it going to be trusted coming from the source? We've seen that a lot coming up now over the past year around, um, just around COVID information, but really want to get a, a better understanding from, from people as to kind of trust and how, how you access and consume um, knowledge and information. And then obviously that age, like age or question is how then does that transfer into positive health behavior, um, which yeah, we don't always necessarily see within a short frame, um, like time frame of projects that we implement, but uh, I'd like to hear that. From, from, um, yeah, from the, the various um, organizations and community members. Can I, can I hop in here with, with another comment? So we're working on a project with the Medical Research Council and it's a program of keeping young adolescent uh, women in school, uh, uh, giving them information on, on birth control, um, the, the, and HIV status. Um, and one of the intents is to try and take this road to health booklet and repurpose it for, for that community. Um, and the, the idea is to try and promote this through the clinics and through the healthcare workers in the schools. I'm doing my nut trying to um, uh, get the, the implementers of this project to have a look at social influences instead of trying to get healthcare workers to promote this kind of information, to get social influences who are in the schools, who are in the communities to push this information. Um, I, I think it's the way kids these days get their information. It's the way they trust information. Um, but I'm really struggling to get that through because traditionally it's the healthcare workers that have to educate the, the, the patients. Um, if anybody's got any ideas on how, how I can push that agenda, or if maybe I'm you know, pushing a cow up a flight of stairs, this is never gonna work, then I'm happy to, happy to take that comment as well. I think that's a good topic for maybe our next webinar or a future webinar to like really kind of maybe spend some time brainstorming about the Road to Health booklet and find out how it's actually used in the hands of health workers from their from their perspective, and then, you know, get get some people in that conversation. So, to like stay tuned. Um, Shri, do you want to? And I'm, I'm mindful of time. So, Shri, do you want to make a kind of a final comments, and then uh, Nervo and I will close out today's webinar. You know, thanks, thanks, Melissa. No, I, I it was it was fascinating to hear hear the you know hear hear the other um, other folks sort of. Um, provide that context because I think, like for 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 uh, for the Magi, I think when we often come in with this sort of constraint around time and like projects, um, uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting because not only are we racing against time, but it takes a long time to like figure out you know who, who are the decision makers themselves. You know, it just you're always racing against these these two concepts. So one thing that that if if there was a situation where there are no constraints, uh, I I would sort of even Push, push even further back before the technology elements come in come into place itself in terms of 
how does the how does the program itself like evolve into into um, uh, into sort of the, the latest and greatest with with all the necessary inputs uh, and and it's not not just sort of driven only by by certain sort of let's say subject matter experts uh, you know how, how does the program itself get get developed uh, with inputs from various community members various uh, stakeholders um, uh, and so on and so forth before the technology comes in because technology is only going to you know it's only going to sort of um, throw light on on what the program in itself is rather than solve anything major like it's 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 meant to address the gaps that that the program uh, you know the way the program is sort of designed so so in a way if we can go back to, to designing the programs uh, such that um, technology sort of just elevates that a little bit more then then that that would be that would sort of be the the ideal case case scenario in some ways um, yeah. I'm glad this is being recorded because this means I can go back and take notes on like everything you guys have shared. Um, I saw Alistair had to had his hand up. I don't know if it's possible for him to ask that question. Um, I think we need our or yes. Oh, Martin wanted to respond to the Road to Health booklet app. Um, we we are like over time. Um, so I just want to check with you guys. How are you guys doing on time? You have to run. <laughs> I, I unfortunately have to drop off uh, for, uh, for another meeting. Um, okay. Uh, Shree, thanks so much for your time. Uh, and, and I think uh, everybody has to go, but we, we are all in touch via the network so we can ask each other questions and there will be a next webinar and a workshop, uh, I think in the coming coming weeks. So uh, we will uh, continue this conversation, I think over the, over the coming months. Absolutely, so, thanks. Thanks, Melissa, Nervo and uh, Kira and Martin. It was, was wonderful uh, catching up as well. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Likewise, Sorry yes. to everybody that wasn't able to ask your questions. Um, I, I hope this was an interesting kind of first first webinar. Uh, I'm excited for all the ongoing and future com conversations. Uh, and I'm really happy to be be working with all of you, both the attendees and the, the panelists. So thank you so much.